Hey everybody, welcome to the show. This is a special episode of Model Railroading 101 with a slightly different twist on it. I'm here with my friend Kevin Hill who's brought some model trains, but they're not the kind that we normally talk about on this channel. What are you going to talk about here? Well, today we're going to talk about the basic maintenance and repair of post-war era American Flyer trains. Um, I figure this is a good time of year uh, to talk about this because most people are bringing out grandpa's old train from the attic and maybe it doesn't run and they're wondering what's going on. So hopefully this video will help you out. So this is in the context of maybe trains around the Christmas tree, something like that? Yes. All right. Well, sounds good. Should we go over to the workbench? Let's do that. We're going to the workbench. All right, here we go. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about uh, today is three books that I think are essential for anyone that wants to do anything with American Flyer uh, trains. The first is the Complete Service Manual uh, for American Flyer trains. This one happens to be by K-Line, but uh, there's a number of publishers that have printed them. Uh, what this is, is it's actually a reprint of the original service manuals that all the American Flyer techs got uh, back in the day. So, very helpful resource. It's got all your part numbers and everything that you need, schematics and stuff like that in there. Weren't you mentioning something before off camera about how the number on the locomotive is the part number or something Yes, like that? so that's actually a good point. Um, on the locomotives, any American Flyer locomotive, freight car, <clears throat> whatever it is, the road number that's on that piece of equipment is the catalog number so if you have, for example, this is the 283, if you have an American Flyer 283, you just go in the book, find your American Flyer 283, and that's uh, going to give you the list of parts for that locomotive. Uh, the next book we have here is by Tom Barker. Uh, he's kind of a guru in the American Flyer community, and he wrote this book kind of as a... Um, what, what would we call that? An, a, addendum, an, an addendum to the uh, to the service manual, and he has photos in here that basically show here's what the service manual's saying, and here's what it actually looks like in real life, not in a technical drawing. Um, and he has little things in here that say, well, here's how the manual says how to do it. Here's an easier way that I've developed to do it and he puts all that in here so it's almost like a cliff notes version yeah cliff notes service. version yeah. but it's good to have both it's good to have both now the third book that we have is volume two of tom barker's book now this one goes more in depth first and it has color photos but it goes more in depth into the actual uh full restoration of american flyer equipment so did you learn all your stuff of working on the locomotives from these books or what yeah but a lot of it came out of these three books and then some of it i developed on my own you know like figured out oh here's actually an easier way to do that yeah and, or you know well we know you accomplished can do that. yeah because you wear glasses which makes you smart exactly yeah okay so before we get to the trains we're going to talk about the transformer because you can't have trains without a transformer uh, and, and there's a few safety things that we have to go over with this because we don't want people electrocuting themselves or setting their house on fire that would be for a sad holiday or anything like that <laughs> so when you get your train out of the attic you know more than likely it's been up there for you know 40 years or whatever you want to check the power cord on the transformer and make sure that it's not frayed and you don't have any um you know exposed wires or anything like that if you do it's super easy to change the cord oh, there's four screws that hold the transformer together you just open it up unsolder the connections and then you can put a new cord on and you can use any kind of cord i've used is that covered in those books too yeah yeah that yeah. it actually is um pretty much anything that we don't you know directly discuss here is covered in the books okay um but i've used um an indoor power extension cord just cut the female end off of it expose the wire and then you can solder it in here and you got oh, a new power cord. I see what you're saying. It's so you can use any power cord. Any so power cord, yeah. Any piece of junk that you're throwing away that has a cord attached. Yeah, to you it, could you use that. Switch it out. I, yeah. You know, I, cool. you don't have to go find the specific American Flyer cord. Yeah. Um, but but that's, anyway. That thing looks like an antique. I mean, it is. This is probably about 1950. So wow. it's not, that's not that old in American Flyer years because you figure about 
15 years later they were out of existence so right um but the next thing we're going to talk about with these transformers is they all all american flyer transformers have a hum when you plug them in it's nothing to be worried about there's going to be a hum some are louder than others but they're going to hum well, what do you mean like it has a buzzing noise? Yeah, or yeah, it's going to... Yeah, we'll plug it in here. Wow, that thing's really loud, Kevin. Yeah, so, you know, as you can see, it does have a hum to it. They all do. Some, like I said, are louder than others. This one happens to be one of the louder ones, so, you know, wouldn't it... Wouldn't you figure that's the one that I brought today? Right, figure. Um, but, but yeah, it's, good, it's, it's good though because it demonstrates exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's yeah. nothing to be alarmed about. Your house isn't going to burn down. You know, nothing's going to happen. That's just the nature of the beast here. So, all right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is connecting the transformer to the track, and you should have one of these uh, track terminals. It's really simple to use. You just take this little metal piece right here that's on the outside, and that goes against your outside rail. And then this snap snaps up on the inside rail, like so. So now we're gonna connect the track terminal to the transformer. Uh, you're gonna have two wires coming out of here. They could be any color because usually the original wires that came with this are long gone. Uh, from the factory, you had a black wire and a yellow wire, but here we have black and white. But the important part is that you'll see on one side of the track terminal, it says base post. Whatever wire is in there goes to the jack on the transformer that says base on it on um, base post it's the post yeah it's the post out of the transformer yeah. yeah it goes to the base post on the transformer and the other wire is going to go to your 7 to 16 volt post on the transformer is it labeled like that yes. on the clip thing yeah yeah the, well you no know, you don't have 7 to 16 on the clip but uh, the base post is labeled and what's the reason for going to the variable one? Is it a variable voltage? Yeah, it's variable speed? voltage that controls your speed. The one that's just 16 is for accessories. Okay, that would have been my guess. Yeah. So what if you get the transformer hooked up and the train doesn't run? That sucks. Well, now we're going to talk about what you do in that case. Uh, I have here a few different examples of American Flyer locomotives. Um, under the hood, these engines are all pretty much identical. Um, so any of the topics we're going to cover today could be applied to almost any American Flyer locomotive. So the most important thing when you're getting your train out of storage is do not attempt to run the train without oil. Oil first. That's the most important thing because the train has most likely been in storage for 40 years at least and is probably bone dry. So oil, very important. Lube is important. <laughs> Okay, so let's just pretend you just got your train out of the box. It hasn't seen the light of day in 40 years. What do you do now? Well, you're going to want to lubricate it first. So you're going to use a light oil, uh, something like this. Light to medium oil will work. You don't want to use anything too heavy. No, no, no motor oil? No or motor oil. oil. What about olive oil? We're olive oil? We're well, both Italian, so you would want to... I would tend to go to, to olive oil, but that, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> okay, so don't so, so, don't use olive oil. Don't use motor oil. Mm -hmm. Use a medium. What is it? Some kind of a it's machine a, oil. This type is thing. a hot. It's called a Hob E Lube, but you can use any any meat light to medium oil works with these things. You could use three in one oil if you wanted to. Oh, okay. So yeah. gen generic style yeah. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to start by lubricating the uh, drive rods on the side of the locomotive, uh, right at the shoulder screw where it goes into the into the wheel. I didn't even know that's what that's called. That's what American Flyer calls them. They, oh. That might be a different term for it, but in all the books they call it a shoulder screw. Then you're going to uh, lubricate up here by the cylinder. Okay, and you're going to do the same thing on both sides right, of the sense. locomotive, obviously. Yeah. We won't show the other side yeah. just for the sake of saving time. Yeah. And then you're going to come turn the engine over and you're going to get all the axles here on the uh, first on the, the pilot truck here up in there. Can you see this, John? Yep, I can see what you're doing there. Okay. 
you're, you're get you're creating the crack space there so that yep. you can get to it. Yeah. It's also nice why those little oil deals have the long. Yeah, spot. it makes it easier than using say a three in one can. But yeah. if that's all you've got, then trailing truck back here on the trailing truck. Yeah. Yeah, I knew what it was called. Yeah. It's almost like I knew what I was talking about for a minute. And you're gonna do the screw here where the uh, tender attaches to the locomotive. 283s are permanently attached to their tender, permanently hardwired. So the next thing we're going to do before we get to lubricating the tender is take this little cover off here that covers the, uh, the main drive gear. Is that a flathead screwdriver? Flathead, yeah. Flathead screwdriver. Well, I mean, you'll use whatever's there, right? I mean, but that, that happens. They always flathead. have flatheads. They, I've never seen one that didn't unless it's something that somebody put in there aftermarket. So that exposes our gear. So I have the cover off of our drive gear. And you can see this one's pretty clean. Did because you, yeah, Did you already clean this one? Well, this is one of my uh, locomotives that I run on my layout at home. So this is, I, I take very good care of all my equipment. Yeah. So, But normally when you've opened this cover for the first time, there's going to be dried grease all around this gear. You don't want to run with that in there. So you take a toothpick like this and you would dig it. Oh, there's a little bit. Oh, right maybe, there. Maybe it wasn't as clean as you thought. Yeah. So maybe, you, maybe you would you need to service your engine. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why we're here. Yeah. So you would you would uh, dig out all this old gunked up grease. There's actually a little bit of it in here. You need to take better care of your models. I know. No, this grease isn't that old. This it is gunked be, up, that, though. Yeah, that might be some of the stuff I put in there. Yeah. But, it could also be a function of it being colder lately, too, right? Yeah. So you're going to clean out any old gunked up grease that's in there. Then you're going to put new grease in there. And I have this uh, Bachman Easy Lube <laughs> gear grease. But uh, you can use any uh, light gear grease for this. But I, I like this stuff because it is plastic compatible for uh, some of the, the newer flyer models that have plastic in this area. But uh, you're just going to take your toothpick and get a little bit of it like this. And just put it on the gear. Probably not too much. Not, right? not, once no. you start running, it's going to spread yeah. it around. Yeah, not a whole lot. And I like to get some on the axle as well down in here. And then, um, then you're going to take your same medium oil. Ah, the one with the long thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. While you have the engine positioned like this, and you can really hit the axle good in there. And then you're going to hit all these other, the axles for the other drivers as well. Both sides, of course. Okay, so now while we have the engine in this position, we're also going to lubricate the armature bearing for the motor. Which uh, most American Flyer engines will have a little cotton wick that's right here. And you just want to saturate that wick with your oil. And that will keep the armature bearing nice and lubricated while the engine's running. Some engines don't have this wick. Most of them do. If, it, if they don't, then just put a few drops of oil in that little hole right there. And uh, that'll pretty much take care of the armature bearing. So that's all the lubrication points for this uh, particular locomotive. I'm going to put this gear cover back on and we're going to go ahead and lubricate its tender. You're going to use two different types of oil for this. You're going to use the same medium oil that we've been using and you're going to use a conductive oil. This is, uh, again, Bachman Easy Lube brand oil. It's conductive lube. So what I like to do here is I'll use my medium oil uh, where the truck meets the, the frame and just drop some oil in there. Now I'm going to use my conductive oil here actually on the axles because this is where the locomotive picks up its current. So you want to have good contact. Yeah, I've noticed those copper strips there that yes. are those brushes on the axle? Is that how that works? Yes. Oh. Um, so you'll notice that there's actually copper wheels here uh -huh. and copper wheels here. Yeah. On That's another sides. thing actually we'll, we, we should mention that. You need to make sure that your copper wheels are on the opposite sides on this. Because if somebody took the wheels off your engine and put 
both copper wheels on the same side, it's going to cause a short when you put your engine on the tracks. So now that we've done that, we're going to clean the wheels, which I like to use lighter fluid, like for a for a uh, Zippo lighter type of thing. It's a little cleaner uh, oil. It's actually got about a thousand different uses, but uh, I put it on a Q-tip like this. You saturate your Q-tip up. You could also use rubbing alcohol for this, but I find that uh, lighter fluid works a lot better. It takes a lot of the, uh, the thicker crap that you're going to get on American Flyer wheels off. So what you're going to do is you're going to put your Q-tip on the wheel and then use your other hand to rotate it. And you'll see... Yeah, I'm getting some stuff off there. That looks like when I cleaned my ears out. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, this engine's one of my regular operators, so they're not too dirty. I usually keep them pretty clean, but... I don't know, Kevin. That looks pretty dirty. Oh, you should see some of the stuff that's been sitting for a while. Yeah. This Q-tip would be completely black. Yuck. Like, completely. Probably would have to re redo it a few times, huh? Before uh -huh. it was clean. Yeah. I'll tell you another trick. Sometimes, if... The wheels are really dirty. Mm -hmm. Take a Dremel. What, a wire brush work, maybe? Yeah, wire brush. Mm -hmm. Just do them like that. Yeah, these wheels, by by uh, toy train standards, these are not all that dirty. Yeah. What's amazing, if this, what's amazing is it probably runs fine like that. Huh? It runs great. Yeah, if, if this was an HO model, the thing probably wouldn't run. Yeah. If they were like that. But then you're going to uh, clean the middle of the axle because, as you see, that's where the little sweeper is that actually transmits the current to the reverse unit. And that same thing. You'll just put the Q-tip on the center of the axle and rub. So the next thing I'm going to do is just a little contact cleaning here of this little copper plate. And I'm using this electrical contact spray for that. Uh, I like the CRC brand because it is plastic compatible. A lot of the stuff, if you get it on plastic, it'll actually melt the plastic. So uh, just a quick, quick shot in here. And that's all there is to it. This electrical contact spray is what we affectionately refer to as the magical fluid that makes American Flyer run. Because generally if you have a problem with your locomotive and you just shower it in this stuff, it'll run. And now lastly we're going to lubricate the draw bar between the tender and the locomotive. Again with your medium oil. Just a little oil on both sides of the draw bar here. Does that actually conduct electricity? Or the is draw bar? Simply, yeah. No. Okay, mm -hmm. so the electricity... No, the electricity is transmitted through the wires here okay. that are between the tender and the engine. And like I said, the 283 is permanently wired to its tender. Most uh, American Flyer locomotives have a little jack that goes between them. So far, everything that we've been covering has been on pre-1957 American Flyer locomotives. Uh, the post-1957 locomotives are a little bit different, and we're going to cover that a little later in the video here. Um, but for now, we're going to talk about what to do if you've lubricated your engine and it doesn't run. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the other locomotive over here has five digits. Isn't that one of the spotting features for the pre and post? Yes, yes. So everything pre-1957 has a three-digit uh, number on the cab. The post-1957 locomotives will have a five-digit number okay. on the cab. That's what and I and same with the rolling stock also. Okay. Actually, but I remember talking about that at some point, but I don't know that we've mentioned that yet. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was something worth talking about. Yep. So nine times out of ten, if you're having an issue after you've lubricated and everything, it's not running. The problem on a pre-1957 engine is going to be in the reverse unit, which on most American Flyer locomotives is located in the tender. But if you have an older style locomotive like this Royal Blue here, it's actually in the locomotive. Same concept, they work the same way, the only difference is it's in the engine as opposed to in the tender. And you can tell where it is by the slot that's cut out of the top of the locomotive where the locking lever is here. Okay. A lot of times the engine was put away and it's locked in neutral. 
so when you put it on the tracks if it doesn't run just try first cycling the locking lever it's all on on this engine it's under the tender but same uh, concept cycle the locking lever then try it again okay a lot of times it might have been locked in neutral these have a three position reverse unit the cycle for them is forward neutral reverse neutral so uh, what that means is if you apply power to the track the engine will start running in forward then if you take the power away it'll stop and then you put power on again it'll go into neutral so it'll just sit there with the headlight and smoke unit running if so equipped uh, then you take the power away again and you put the power on again it'll go in reverse oh that's how you get your difference in directions yep the locking lever that we discussed the purpose of that is to as, as the name suggests lock the locomotive in one direction so if the train is running in forward and you want it to keep running in forward you have to slide the locking lever over to the locked position with the engine running when you apply power to the track it activates this solenoid which forces this metal plate up which then in turn rotates this drum which changes the way the electricity is oriented to the motor uh, essentially changing the way the motor is wired to either run in forward or reverse or not run at all so it's really it's a physical redistribution of the power sort of it, isn't it it is it's not like DC where you have a polarity so now we have the engine flip back over again we're gonna take the body off the tender so we can access the reverse unit that's inside the tender normally you would have four screws this engine has two screws uh, it's missing a couple screws I didn't know that but you have a couple screws loose yeah so you're gonna just remove those screws these are also flathead yep every about everything on American Flyer is flathead unless they've been replaced at some point in the engines life just because they're old and you know that was the common screw back in the day so now that we have the tender shell removed we can turn the engine back over and we see that yes there's the reverse unit oh. and this is a little weight to add weight to the tender if this is missing you'll likely have issues with your reverse unit because as the trains going down the tracks if it hits a bump and this weight isn't here it'll throw the reverse unit in neutral oh that sucks yeah I, I found that out the hard way because I bought an engine and its weight was missing and I was trying to figure out why does this thing keep going into neutral well I had an extra weight in my junk bin and I put that in the tender and that solved the problem hmm. so if you're having problems with your reverse unit you first want to look at the condition of what we call the fingers that's these little copper uh, fingers fingers that <laughs> come down here and make contact with this little drum because what happens when this reverse unit cycles the drum rotates and depending on how the drum is oriented it's going to determine if the engines in neutral if it's in forward or if it's in reverse there's two here and then there's uh, two more does, does it just change the contact points yeah is that, is that what's happening mm -hmm. it basically it changes it changes the way that the engine is wired uh -huh. basically to run either in forward reverse or neutral and so there's two fingers on the top and then two on the bottom here and you're going to want to look at the condition of those because with use like anything they wear out and you'll see they'll a lot of times they'll have little holes in the dipped uh, section of the finger hmm. and if that's the case they're super easy to replace you just take your needle nose pliers and you twist these two tabs right here pull them off unsolder your connections just make sure you solder the the uh, same wires to the same points on your new fingers and you know an easy way to do that is just do one wire at a time one at a time yeah and then just put them back where they go and then you put the new fingers on there twist that back on and you're ready to go if the fingers are dirty or if they're not touching the drum what you're going to want to do is the same thing twist these two tabs with needle nose pliers pull them off and clean the fingers and then you're going to want to bend them slightly downward with your finger just slightly because if you do it too much the drum's not going to be able to rotate so they work a lot like sweepers on trucks right yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. And if you open this up and you see that, well, there's no holes in the fingers, they look okay, like this one does, then what you're going to do is you're going to come in here again with your magical contact cleaner and you're going to spray the drum. A lot. It's on, almost like carburetor cleaner, huh? Yeah, on both sides. And again, 90% of the time, when I come in here with a reverse unit, without taking the reverse unit apart, if I just spray it with this, the reverse unit will work perfectly. So this next step is something that you're going to do, A, if all the previous steps didn't work and the engine still doesn't run quite right, or B, if the engine already has eight hours of runtime on it, this is something that you're also going to want to do uh, to help maintain the locomotive. Okay, so this is a troubleshooting, a non-running, or maintaining a working yeah. one. Okay, mm -hmm. that's good to know. Yep, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the shell off of this engine. There's on this engine there's two screws here that hold the shell to the to the frame and then there's an additional screw here that holds the headlight to the frame. I'm also going to take that out because it's wired to the frame. Okay. And then there's a clip on the or I guess a slider on the back of the engine. Once you take those screws off, you should be able to slide the shell off of the frame. Some engines are a little more stubborn. They they make you take the sliders off. But if you try sliding it off, usually it'll come right off. And then we're also going to take the drive rod off of this locomotive. It just comes off with this bolt right here. Then you pull the rod out of the, uh, the cylinder here, and you can set it aside. You can leave the connecting rod in place. We're going to do that on both sides of the locomotive. Probably only show one side for the, the sake of the video. So most smoke-equipped... American flower locomotives will also have what they call a chimney. It's a little tube that comes from the smoke unit up to the stack. It's usually either made out of copper or red plastic. And what you're going to do is you're just going to take your flathead screwdriver and it'll have a little notch in it and you're going to stick it in the smokestack and just rotate the tube. So and Is the tube threaded? It is, yeah. Yeah, it's threaded. It's loose now. I just need a little needle nose pliers. Yeah, there we go. And there it is. So here's the 283 with its cover off, with its shell removed. I'll explain to you what you're looking at here. Uh, we have the motor. This is the smoke and choo-choo unit, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So the first thing we're going to do is check the brushes on the locomotive. Okay. These are two little carbon pieces that fit inside these tubes. It's made out of the same material like a pencil lead carbon. So what you do to, to uh, get the brushes out is you're going to slide up on this little uh, copper piece here that's attached to the tube. And you're going to be really careful when you're doing this. You want to have your hand kind of covering it as you're doing it because there's a spring in here, a brush spring. And if you're not careful, when you take this cover off, the spring will shoot across the room and you'll never see it again. <laughs> so now I'm going to slowly take this out and I'm putting my fingernail over this now. And there's our spring. We saved it. So you're going to pull the spring out. Set that aside. So are you just checking if the brush is long enough? If it's or? long enough um, and if it's clean. We're going to do the same thing on this side. Yep. Spring out. Now we're going to see if the brushes will fall out on their own. Sometimes they won't. They won't. So we're going to move on to step two which is good. We're going to take the actual uh, motor apart. Oh boy. Oh, it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. It does sound hard. It, two screws hold the whole motor together. Are you serious? Yeah. Okay, that's not that hard. So the top screw and the bottom screw down here is all that hold this motor together. Is there a spring on that too? No. Okay, so now the screws are out. We're going to take the uh, back of the motor off. So you see here is the armature bearing in the middle and our two brush tubes are on the outside. You can see the ends of the brushes sticking out so I'm just going to take my screwdriver 
and push them out of the tube. Oh, I see. It pushes out onto the other side that you were just trying to yep. fish and, it out of. And there they are. So these are our carbon brushes. These ones are actually um, not in bad shape lengthwise, but they could use a little cleaning. How long should they be? Or like, what's what's a new one like? I guess is the real question. Not much longer than that. These okay. brushes here are only about a year old, so they don't wear down too terribly quickly. So what you do with this is just again with our magical contact cleaner, just give a little shot on the end of the brush. If you go in there and they're really short, like you can see this, this brush has a, a shoulder on it. If they're about down to that shoulder or a little uh, before that, you're going to want to change them out. And when you change these brushes out, also change out the brush springs. They're usually sold together, so that's easy. Okay. But Where do you get those? Um, I usually get them, you can find them through a couple vendors that uh, specialize in post-war American Flyer. Cool. Um, if you just search American Flyer brushes, uh, they'll come up. So now we're going to pull the armature out of the motor. And you can see, well, it's in there. You can't pull it out. Well, what you're going to do is you're just going to spin it out like this. So is it threaded or? Nope. You're just pulling as you're turning? Nope. Is that it? Yeah, see, there's a gear in here, and oh. you got to work the gear out. Right, the gear. so the gear is kind of a screw. Yeah, so it? it is kind of like a screw. So this is the armature. This copper area of the armature is the commutator or collector, as they like to call it in Europe. And you want to make sure that that is clean. So again, we're going to use our Q-tips and our lighter fluid. And we're going to clean this uh, commutator. So I have a, probably a dumb question. Oh, that, that's really clean. Look at that. It's mm -hmm. taking all kinds of junk off. The question I have is, why wouldn't you use that spray stuff on that? Well, it doesn't last very long. It evaporates, uh -huh. and I want to be able to come in here and you're really you're really scrub. scrubbing it, huh? Scrub, yeah. So now we have the plates of the commutator fairly clean here. There's you can see there's three plates. In between these plates are these little grooves, mm -hmm. and you want to come in here with something like a small uh, flathead screwdriver and just run it through there and you can see I got a little bit of carbon out of there from the brushes as they're running they wear down and that uh, carbon actually conducts electricity so you don't want to have that between your plates that could create a short couldn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, while we have the armature out of the motor if we're going to lubricate the inside armature bearing um, we're going to use our same medium oil and just put a little oil in there and that's all there is to that. So the last thing I'm going to do while I have this engine apart is just put a small drop of oil here for the smoke and choo-choo unit uh, piston. This kind of helps to seal it and you get a better choo-choo sound uh, when the engine's running. Also there's a small rod uh, where this rod connects to the piston inside here. You're going to want to oil that. So this is the American Flyer smoke and choo-choo unit. This is kind of an incredible feat of primitive engineering at the time. They didn't have digital decoders or anything to make sound. So what this is, is there's a little piston inside this cylinder that's connected to this rod that's in turn connected to the wheels. And as the wheels rotate, they turn this rod, which pushes the piston in and out, that forces a small puff of air through a little hole that causes a chuffing sound as the engine is going down the track and this puff of air also pushes the smoke out the stack. Oh, so it's out actually in so, time, right? So what you get is you get chuffing that's perfectly in time with the revolutions of the wheels and smoke that's synchronized with the chuffing. So you don't even have to mess with the CV to get your rotations right. Nope, it's, it's perfectly uh, done for you. So I hear that big loud buzzing. Let's see it work because I know that's why it's buzzing like All that. All right. So here's how it works. Oh. It looks like the strobe light. Yeah. Yeah. 
I can hear the chucking and I can see the smoke. Yep. You can see the smoke on your camera? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's the smoke and choo-choo unit. Uh, something interesting to note on this, I'll turn it off here so we don't get gassed out. Um, well, it's California, so it's already smoky enough. Yeah, well, we don't need that inside, too. Yeah. But uh, when you're... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as you're saying, sir, when you're uh... when when you're bringing your engine out of storage, sometimes a uh, an issue that you'll see with these smoke units is they'll smoke really good when you first get them going, but then the smoke will die off. And an easy solution for that is you'll take a can of WD-40 and stick it down the smokestack on the engine, and just put a little shot of WD-40 in the smoke unit, let it sit overnight and then come in in the morning and turn the engine upside down for a couple of minutes uh, to let the uh, what's left of the WD-40 drain out. Then you're going to want to put about 25 to 30 drops of smoke fluid. I use MTH smoke fluid because it's designed for wick type smoke units like this. Uh, put about 25 to 30 drops of smoke fluid in there and then it should work fine because usually that problem is due to a gummed up wick. Um, if that doesn't solve your problem, then the smoke unit needs to be re-wicked, and that's a little more in-depth uh, job that we're not going to cover today, but that's covered in the book. Okay, or yeah. may maybe some other time when you have yeah. one that needs that. Yeah. This is my American Flyer 21100. It's actually a 1957 um, model, and I'm going to take this apart and show you kind of the, the differences between the pre-1957 and post-1957 American Flyer locomotives because there are a few differences between the two here. So here we have the uh, 283 and the 21100 next to each other. You can see that there are some differences here and we're going to go over that. Uh, but first I do want to make a little clarification here. I've been referring to this in the video as the pre-57 and post-57 locomotives trying to make it easier for the people that or not really in the American Flyer community um, to understand. In the community, we call this three-digit and five-digit locomotives. Oh, uh, based on the road numbers? Based on the road numbers. Yeah. The five-digit locomotive uh, started in 57. So I guess that the proper term would be, you know, post-1956. If you ever are in an American Flyer forum or community, it's three-digit, five-digit. Okay. For any American Flyer purists that are watching this video, yes, this is a 21100. I've added the smoke and choo-choo unit to this locomotive uh, because, as you know, they came from the factory without smoke and choo-choo. So that's not what we're looking at, though. You wanted to point out no. the, the motor stuff now? No, or? but I, I, I figured I'd throw that in there for the if anybody looks at it and says, no, that's not a 21100. It's got smoke and choo-choo in oh, there. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for the clarification. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't have known. But, yeah. But a lot of people watching probably do know that. Yeah. So if there is an American Flyer person out there, they'll be able to they'll look at it and be like, wait, that's got smoke and choo-choo. Why? What? No. It was added by the user. Yeah. Yeah. So the first difference that you're going to see is, well, what's this gadget on the back of the motor here? Well, that is the five-digit reverse unit. This oh, oh, hold on now. That, that's the reverse unit that was in the tender on the other one? No. Kind of? Or? Well, yes. There was a reverse unit in the tender. This is a completely different design of a reverse unit. Much better design, in my opinion. Um, there's not even anything to cover as far as maintenance and repair on this thing because nothing ever goes wrong in them. Oh, okay. And if they do, you just replace the unit. Okay. But this is a very reliable unit. It's a two position reverse unit. So what does that mean? Well, there's no neutral position. It just goes from forward to reverse when you cut the power. The only downside to that is if you have a patch of dirty track, the engine might hit the dirty track and take off in reverse. Right. So, <laughs> but much, in my opinion, much better designed reverse unit. The locking lever, like we discussed on the three position reverse unit that slid back and forth on this one is this little, uh, device here that moves up and down. Up is the locked position, locking it in a direction, and then down is the unlocked position to go forward and reverse. So I'm not going to show taking this motor apart because it is basically 
the same process as what we did on the three digit locomotive. It's the same two screws here that hold the whole motor uh, together. Yep. The only difference is in taking the back of this motor off, you're also going to be removing the reverse unit. And you have to be very careful of this small uh, little thin wire that connects to the reverse uh, unit here that you don't break that. Uh, especially right here where it's soldered on. If you do break it, it's just an easy solder job to put it back on. Uh, nine times out of ten when I take them off, I break it. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> just because I'm not careful, but uh, yeah. Just be very careful of that. And then I will show you here, the armature in this motor is a little different. I have a five-digit armature here, and you can see that the collector, or again, commutator, is a drum type instead of the... Uh, flat type that we had on the three digit uh -huh. but cleaning again the same process you just take your q-tip with the lighter fluid and wash these and then you would come in here with your little uh, screwdriver and clean the separations between the plates taking the brushes out of this motor is a little bit different also instead of being straight in the back like they were on the three digit locomotive uh, they're on in the side here in these little copper uh, square tubes because uh, they do have square brushes. So what you're going to do is you're going to loosen the screw here on this side just a little bit and then you see the brush tube comes with it. Again, being careful not to break this little wire that goes to the reversing unit. Does it have a screw, uh, a spring also? Yeah, there's a spring in here. Uh, usually the spring isn't going to shoot out because it is contained in the tube uh -huh. because we're actually taking the whole brush tube out. So the spring's basically pushed in, yep. in the bottom of that thing, isn't it? Yep. So there's our brush tube and brush spring. And the brush is here. It just popped right out, didn't it? Yep. And you can see that this brush is square. The only thing you want to be aware of when you're taking, when you're, when you're putting this brush back in there, is if you look at the brush, you'll see that it has a contour that will match the shape of the commutator. You want to make sure that you get it in there the same way that it came out. Because if you put it in there the other way, it's not going to work right. Alright, so now that we have our locomotive ready to go, we're going to take a look at some of the uh, freight cars, rolling stock here, for our train, because they need maintenance too. Uh, I have here three freight cars that I recently purchased at a uh, train show. I haven't done anything to them yet, so they're still in there as found, uh, been sitting for 40 years state right now. So it gives us a good opportunity to see some of the things that you might find when you take your trains out of storage. So here we have two different types of couplers to look at. Uh, this one here is what they call a link coupler. And this was used until about 1952. And you can see it's just a little plastic link here that uh, would connect to the other to this pin on the other car. Uh, but after 1952, they switched over to a more realistic knuckle type coupler to better compete with Lionel who had already been using the knuckle coupler. Now if you have a mixture of link coupler and knuckle coupler equipment as a lot of people do, uh, you can actually get conversion kits for these and it's really easy. You just basically tap this pin out, this, this little rivet pin here, and the link comes off and then it has a special knuckle that will slide over that and then you put another rivet in there and then now you have a knuckle coupler equipped car. Okay, so the first thing that we're looking at here is you see on these two cars you have a white film over the coupler on this car and on the wheels of this car. This is a very common thing that you find on a lot of these American Flyer uh, cars and what it is is it's actually the release agent that was used to release the plastic from the molds and after you know 50 60 years it starts to uh, well turn white so there's actually a really easy way to get rid of this and you use a hair dryer set to high now some people would use a heat gun for this but I would advise against that because the heat gun actually gets a little bit too hot and you can actually melt the parts oh, that's on the not car good. So, that's really bad. So, uh, <laughs> and you'll see here that when we uh, turn this on, it'll just kind of melt right away.
It's mostly gone, huh? On the, the coupler, you see any other stuff there? Oh, what I'm seeing is it was a reflection from the light, I think. Yeah. No, actually, no, it's gone now. Yeah. Wow, that's like magic. So you don't have to wipe it off or anything? Nope. Huh. And that works on the white stuff on the wheels too, huh? Yep. Or on the body. Sometimes you'll see it on the body oh. of the car. like Kevin is that it seems to have liquefied the stuff mm -hmm. and then it evaporates yep because when it's done evaporating which is happening right now mm -hmm. it's turning flat black on the camera because yep. it was it was shining under the light because it was still wet wet looking yep yeah that's a cool trick isn't it yeah so that works on the wheels too yeah so we'll do the we'll do the wheels here next now sometimes you'll have to rotate these uh, when you do it, but sometimes the whole wheel will get hot enough and you don't have to rotate them. If you do have to rotate them, I'd advise to be careful because this is basically molten plastic when it's hot, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that didn't take much at all. No. And it actually got the ones on both sides just from that. Nice. So now our wheels look nice like brand new. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing about this to, to me is that's it's really just a cosmetic thing though, right? I mean, that's not mm -hmm. going to make it run better. Well, just look better. Right? In terms of the link couplers, it is a mechanical thing. Oh, right. Because, so help. because with the link couplers... Uh, when you have that white uh, film in there, they don't go up and down as well. Yeah. So they don't, they won't uncouple if you have an automatic uncoupler. Okay, so now we're gonna lubricate this car. Uh, Lubrication is very important on the rolling stock as well, because uh, these cars were built before they have what you might call a needle bearing. You might be familiar with that, uh, John, where the end of the axle comes out to a point. Uh huh. That makes a lot less friction. Well, these just come out to a regular end, so there's a lot more friction in this bearing. So if you don't lubricate it, your engines are going to have to work a lot harder to pull the train. So you're going to lubricate in here, in the journals, like so. Yeah, basically you're just trying to get a little drop of oil wherever the parts touch, right? Yep. No problem. Plus, I would imagine... And then up in oh. here, underneath... Oh, where it turns, right? The bolster? Yep, yep, the bolster. I would imagine, Kevin, and maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong, but if you don't oil, not only will it be harder for the locomotive to pull these, but you're going to also probably get squeaking and noises like that, huh? Yes, yeah, you do get squeaking. And I've had trains where you put together, like, ten cars, put it on the layout, and the engine just struggles... You can lubricate all the cars, it pulls it like there's nothing yeah. behind it. So, yeah, that's about all there is to lubricating the, the rolling stock, uh, most cars. Now we're going to talk about a little bit about lighted cars, like this caboose here. You might have cars with lights in them, passenger cars or cabooses or cabise, whatever you want to call them. Um, some, some people get really angry if you call them cabise. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I threw that in there. Right, just um, in case. We, we don't call it that, but yeah. if you do... <laughs> yeah. So, with these, I like to use the conductive lubricant because, again, you are picking up your current from the uh, axles as you would with a locomotive tender. That car reminds me of an old piggy bank. You had a piggy bank that was a caboose? 
No. But all the piggy banks I ever had had little plugs in the bottom from that looked like that silver thing in the middle there. Oh, well, we're going to get to that. Oh, is that part of this? That's part of this, yeah. Oh. Now, again, just like we did with our locomotive uh, earlier, you're going to clean the wheels on the caboose or passenger car with a Q-tip and some lighter fluid or rubbing alcohol. Right now, but this is only for a rolling stock that picks up electricity. Yeah, there's, there's this no is, need to ro rub off the plastic wheels mm -hmm. and the other ones, right? Unless you have really dirty track, because okay. then then it's spreading the crap. It's around. spreading the crap. So if you look at the wheels and you see they have a coating of grease on them, regardless of if they pick up current or not, I would recommend cleaning them. Yeah. Um, and same thing with this. Much like the the locomotive tender, you have to have the metal wheels on opposite sides of the car. All right, so if you're looking at it and they're all on the same side, yep. you know, that'll solve the it's question not, about why, why the light doesn't out. work and why is my transformer shorting out. So the next thing is the light itself, which is oh, the piggy, the, bank, the, plug. The piggy bank plug that we were talking about. And to open this, all you do is you just twist and it comes right out. And there's your light bulb. If you need to change this bulb, there's two bulbs you can use. Uh, you use a 1447 bulb, that's an 18 volt bulb. Um, or I like to use a 1449 bulb, which is a uh, 14 volt bulb. It burns a little brighter. It's the same bulbs you'd use for the locomotive headlights. I use the 1449s on metal bodied locomotives because they do get a little hotter. And I use the 1447s on plastic bodied locomotives because they don't get quite as hot, they're not as bright, but that's all there is to changing the light bulbs in these cars. Alright, so now that we got the train ready to go, we got to address the track. Ah oh, yes, you have to have something to run your train on. Now, a lot of times when you pull your train out of storage, I know I've seen it in a lot of the used stuff that you find at train shows and things like that, the track is going to have a thin coating of rust on the top of the rails. Now, if you know anything about electricity, that does not bode well for conductivity. So, we're going to take care of that. Now, what I use is this product called Crud Cutter <laughs> that you can get at uh, your local hardware store. Um, now, let me say that this is really nasty stuff. Yeah? It says on the bottle, wear rubber gloves and wear a mask and me being the safety conscious person that I am the first time I read that I said ah can't be that bad it's water based well it's that bad <laughs> my hands were burning so uh, yeah you want to wear rubber gloves and yeah uh, do, do, do not use as an eye wash yeah you want to wear rubber gloves and uh, you want to do this in a, either outside or in a well ventilated room we're, we're very well ventilated right now because we have all the windows and doors open. So I'm going to put my rubber gloves on here. Okay. Well, that was an ordeal, but I've got my rubber gloves on now. And now what you're going to do is you're going to take a sponge like this. I like to use the ones that have the scotch Bright. Uh, oh, the scrubby stuff, huh? Scrubby stuff on one side because it, it helps sometimes. What you're going to do is you take this uh, crud cutter and you saturate the sponge and we're just going to rub on here can you tell if it's working it, it's kind of hard to tell you have to let it sit for a minute uh. after we put this on here Once you get it on, you want to let it sit for about 5-10 minutes. Sometimes if the rust is really bad, you might have to put a second uh, coat on there or use your Scotch-Brite side of your sponge. So it is starting to look to me like the railheads are shiny. Yes. So they're, they're not so rusty looking anymore. And remember, this is toy train, so the tolerances are... A lot less than, say, on, on HO, where the track has to be spotless for the train to run. 
this track here is now ready to go. This the train will run on this. This is perfect now. Yeah, try N scale sometime. That's even more finicky than HO. Yeah. American Flyer is a lot more forgiving. But yeah, this track here is now uh, layout ready, I would say. I mean, unless you spend a whole lot of time on it, you're not going to get it perfect. But I'd say just so you get the coating of rust off the top of the rails, then you're good to go. So the main difference between American Flyer and normal model railroading is when you're working on these things, your hands actually get dirty. All right, so it looks like it's pretty much ready to go, huh? Showtime for the trains. Yeah, the only thing left to do now is to uh, let them run. Sounds like fun. So out of all of what I saw here today, I think I was most impressed by two things. I think that the books were an invaluable resource. I can see why nobody should try to do any of this stuff without the books, because the books show you everything. Yeah, and like we said before, if there's anything that we didn't cover in the video, it's in the books, right? So so there was that, and then I was actually pretty impressed with that little chuff, what were you calling that? The choo-choo? The choo-choo choo unit. That is yeah. the actual uh, title of what, that, that is what it is, the choo-choo unit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, because for something from well over 50 years ago, you know, 60 years ago or, mm -hmm. or more, to have that kind of, I mean, it seems kind of primitive and crude technology, right, compared to what we have yeah. now with all of our DCC and all that. But, but it, it's it worked, you know. It gives and, you a synchronized chuff and, and smoke. So Right. And the other thing is not only does it work, but even 60 years later, it still works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's one of those things like they don't make them like they used to. Kind yeah. of holds true, right? Yeah. There's so. there's a lot of people that have said that that still, in their opinion, is the best uh, sound system that's ever been put in a, in a model locomotive. Yeah. There's a lot of people that say that, so... Yeah, there's no whistle or, or bell, but you get the chuff, which is pretty cool. Yep. And as you can see from running, it works pretty well. So anyway, that'll do it for this episode. And I guess we'll see everybody on some other episode, something else. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know what we'll do, something, you know. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll be together again on camera at some point because it's, <laughs> right? what has it been, three, four times well, now? <laughs> hopefully with Trevor next <laughs> yeah. time. Yeah. We can get, get something done with three professionals instead of two. Yeah. <laughs> or one. So. <laughs> this time it was one professional because I was just learning as you were going along. Yeah. So. Yeah. So anyway, so that's the holiday episode of yeah. special episode of uh, 101 or, or whatever this is now. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we should say uh, happy holidays, everybody. Yeah. Ho, ho, ho. And happy holidays and everything, whatever you celebrate. Hope it's yep. good. We'll see everybody next time. You put this uh, section here against the outside rail, then this little snap snaps up on the inside rail, or the outside rail. Let's let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just keep this rolling. Yeah. Go ahead. I gotta look at myself. Remember. Oh. <laughs>